Hey guys, this is Joe. Today I want to introduce you to our partner Vanta. Achieving ISO 27001 or SOC 2 compliance can unlock major growth for your company and build customer trust, but the process can be time intense and costly. Vanta automates compliance, getting your audit ready quickly and saving up to 85% of associated costs. And Vanta scales with your business, helping you enter new markets. Join 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora that trust Vanta. Claim 20% off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash startup radio that's vanta.com spelled v-a-n-t-a dot com forward slash startup radio Unium is the subscription management hub for B2B SaaS companies whether you're looking to expand to new markets experimenting with pricing models or simply want a streamlined quote to cash process Unium got your back on top of that Union Insights provides the SaaS metrics you need for reporting to the board and for future company evaluation. It gives you the key figures needed to drive your business forward and take strategic decisions. Union, we help SaaS companies manage their B2B customer subscriptions. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from StartupRate.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from the German speaking area, Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Today I have another winner of the German Startup Awards here. Hey, Philip, how you doing? I'm great. Great to be here. Totally our pleasure. You won in the German Startup Awards category investor and not surprisingly, you are an investor. You are the founding partner of Cherry Ventures, yes, l like the fruit, Cherry Ventures, um, based in Berlin. And everybody who's a frequent follower of our news, I do assume they'll already know that name. So, yeah, right. I mean, we 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 started investing a couple of years ago. I, I think we're, the, the the different thing about us is so we started more on the other side of the table. So we were all everyone in the team has been building companies before we became an investor. That's also, and I think, I guess we're going to talk about this a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, how we do things maybe a bit different than, than a lot of other funds. Yes, of course. We will talk about it a lot here. First and foremost, thank you very much for the sponsor of this interview, StartupRaven.com, the easiest and most efficient ways to meet investors and corporation partners. Learn more in the show notes down here. This podcast is also in cooperation with the German Startup Association and the German Startup Awards. As we did last year, we are bringing you several winners of the hashtag GSA22. And here is another awesome example. <laughs> Philip, I've been looking a little bit at your profile. This time we will not link your LinkedIn profile because everybody is tempted to send you pictures that way. We, we, <laughs> we, 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 we'll get at the very end of the interview towards um, how you can pitch it. Um, for everybody who's just interested in that, there will be right now here in YouTube, there will be a note where you can find all the details. <laughs> um, but talking about you, I've seen you attended the Phillips Academy close to Boston. And my first thought was, hmm, are you now addicted to Krispy Kreme donuts? Ah, uh, yeah. Good question. A little bit. I like them. I mean, we were, it was a boarding school. So, uh, and it was, you know, um, age, you know, 14, 15, you weren't really allowed to uh, go to Boston on your own, but we did eventually a couple of times. And of course had a lot of those donuts. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's very fortunate they are not around here. Otherwise you would totally see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you also studied in Buenos Aires. And the first thing that came to mind is, Oh, you dance flamenco. <laughs> uh flamenco no no but uh i i, I have to admit i did a i, I tried like a, a tango uh a buenos aires tango lesson but that didn't really succeed so i i yeah. left it at the one at the one lesson Ta but it was part Argentino. of an exchange 
Ah. Tango argentino, sí. Ah, sí, sí. Yeah. muy bien. Um, I've also seen you work quite a lot, as we said. So, for example, at Daimler Chrysler in Malaysia, I found very interesting. Boston Consulting Group and also Sony BMG in New York City. Um, I assume they've been all internships? Yeah, it was, um, and so was Buenos Aires, by the way. It was part of this uh, program that I did uh, a school in Germany uh, called WHU uh, that I went to. And uh, as part of that education, we had uh, a number of, of uh, internships that we did abroad. And one of them was uh, Malaysia, which was exciting, you know, work for a German car company in Asia where, uh, you know, it was still you know, very, very prestigious thing to drive a Mercedes. And um, we introduced a couple of new models then. And then, uh, yeah, the typical, I would say, consulting gig uh, that uh, sort of every, every kind of business student at some point has to do. And then, yeah, Sony BMG was interesting because I got to go to New York, which was probably uh, one of the yeah, most exciting times uh, uh, in my life and uh, stayed there for a lot longer than the original internship. Uh, I did a lot of music as a kid. So I sang in a band, I played the violin, I have a classical training as a, as a musician um, for, for voice also. So I always thought I would end up in the music industry and, uh, and I didn't eventually, but at least I got to see it for a couple months. So that was, that was fun. And of course, you know, New York was fantastic. Awesome. I honestly also love to sing, but it's so off key. Even the cat takes refuge when I start singing. So no, <laughs> no kind of bother here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do it. Let's not do it here on the podcast. I don't think Great. People, people um, you founded it. your first yeah. company back in 2008. What did drive you after doing Malaysia consulting, music business? Why did you start your own company and what was it all about? Yeah, it's, it was a time where I think the, the, the startup ecosystem in, in Germany and in Europe generally was in a very, very different place. There were very few startups. The first couple of successes, I don't know if you remember, StudiVZ and, and these kind of companies, they were around, but it was a very small scene. And I met, um, when I was still at school writing my master's thesis, I met a couple of uh, business angels that had this idea for a collectibles marketplace. And you know, I got into it, a, a friend of mine, that I was living together, we, we both kind of, we liked the idea, we were starting to do some work on it. And at some point we were like, okay, why not? Let's do it, let's move to Berlin. Uh, and then we started building it. Um, long story short, company's not around anymore. So it wasn't a success. Uh, we, uh, we scaled it to maybe 25, 30 people, we raised a little bit of money from some investors from the sort of eBay uh, environment. So, uh, but yeah, uh, as many, as 90% of all startups, failed so that this one but it was my entry ticket sort of into the world of entrepreneurship it was your first learning what kind of collectibles did you have there on the platform ah, it was art it was antiques but it was also kind of the typical collectibles categories uh, like stamps coins um, we had michael schumacher's first car we had the tennis record that Steffi Graf won the Wimbledon tournament. So we had some really fun items as well uh, like highlight auctions we call them um, and and we tried to get into live auction, and I guess it was a little bit early for that. Anyways, I mean, you see now Sotheby's and Christie's and all these companies have live auction online. But back when we started, it was um, always you know also connection problems, so the connection was just not fast enough to uh, to uh, to uh, really stream a good video quality. Um, yeah, but uh, mixed mixed things. Yeah. yeah, I also noticed it. It's getting easier and easier for you and me to actually connect here and have really good real-time conversation and good video and audio quality, which wasn't mm -hmm. totally the case when I started out podcasting back in 2012. So I really appreciate the quality that improved here. And in 2009, you founded Zalando Lounge. Mm -hmm. it, it was later part of the Hamburg-based um, fashion e-commerce giant Zalando. And how how did you get in there from collectibles to fashion? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> we were we were sort of figuring out that we were not really going anywhere with with Tamundo, my first startup, and and I was looking around. I had the option to go back to BCG to Boss Consulting, uh, and then um, I spoke to uh, two of my close friends from school, Robert and David, who had just started Zalando. Zalando, by the way, it's not in Hamburg; it's in Berlin. 
Berlin-based company, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know, I joined them, and they were like, "Hey, why why don't you join?" And I um, uh, started looking into everything that was sort of new business, um, mm -hmm. so new categories. I led our internationalization uh, when Zalando uh, grew from Germany uh, to 17 markets in Europe, and then we had this idea about um, building a shopping club. Uh, so Zalando Lounge is basically an off-price shopping club similar to in the US, you have Guild Group or uh, uh, Bon Privé in, in France is quite a large business as well. And then, yeah, we we actually set this up. Um, I started uh, the, to build a team, uh, started to build a product, and, uh, and we launched it eventually then in 2009. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you've been a C-level executive there for four years and then for whatever reason your cv at zalando stops and you found cherry ventures can, can you take us um above this cliff how did you make the decision and why did you become a vc yeah so um i was there for six years a little bit more than six years in 2014 zalando ipo'd and you know when a company ipos you You kind of have to really make up your mind. Uh, do you want to stay? Do you want to continue? Um, because when you're public, then it's it's also you know a little bit more difficult to leave. And and so I had this, I would say, thought process on what I wanted to do next. I was turning 30, um, and uh, there was my 30th birthday, which ended up being my birthday party and my Zalando goodbye party in the same in in one. Um, Because I felt I wanted to work in a you know smaller environment again. I had really enjoyed this investment uh, uh, activity that we that we did. So it's also how we started into into uh, then building Cherry. Eventually, was we started very small. We started as business angels. We did small investments with our own money, maybe twenty thousand here, thirty thousand here, fifty thousand. So very very different to how angels invest today, where some of them would personally invest a, a few hundred thousand into one company. But back then it was still small. We did small investments and uh, grew a very interesting portfolio over time. And then when I uh, knew I was going to leave Zalando, I thought about maybe I started another com company, maybe there's a new startup idea that I had. And, and the more I thought about it, the the more often I came back to the idea of professionalizing this investment side. And that was then, and then, you know, Christian, my partner at Cherry and I, we were for a long time sitting next to each other at Zalando and, uh, and we were investing together as angels. And, and then, you know, as, as sort of, I would say this idea uh, became a bit more developed. We didn't say, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's just raise our own fund. We have to obviously take in external money. We can't all do it with our own because we didn't have enough. Uh, so uh, it was then also the decision to bring in investors. And that was kind of the idea of Cherry and how Cherry started. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, you, you raised your first fund, 10 million US dollars. And where did you get your external investors? You just had some friends and say, hey, guys, you got a few millions around? <laughs> so the first fund that we had was very small, as you said. Uh, and it was mostly... Uh, it was even smaller than 10 million. It was um, really just personal capital plus a few close friends. So we just asked a bunch of people, hey, do you want to you want to invest with us? And um, from there, we built a portfolio of maybe around 30 startups. Some were actually really, really successful. Like we ha had some great, great wins in that in that fund. We had Otto One that IPO'd later. We had like Flixbus. We had Quandu. Uh, with Amory Lee, uh, so a really, really cool uh, group of companies. Some, of course, not so successful, but I think in general the fund was uh, was 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 growing very nicely. And then the first institutional fund um, was 150 million euro, um, which was big at the time for a first time fund for early stage fund. Our current fund now is around 300 million, um, so we grew a bit over time. We didn't grow grew too much because we also didn't want to. I, I can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. um, but we started raising that from friends as well. And the, the interesting thing is that a lot of the people that we've invested in that had successful exits now invested in us. So the founder of Amorelli, Lea, 
um, she became an LP in the fund. And the Flixbus guys that we invested in, Jochen, Andre, Daniel, they are now invested in Cherry. So that's really cool to see how then, you know, it's a community, uh, you support each other, and they sort of maybe thought that, you know, if, if these guys do this, then they, they may have an idea what they're doing because they're already invested in us. So um, they supported us. And that was the first chapter, basically, of fundraising. The first couple of million came like that from friends and friends of friends and extended networks and a lot of individuals. It was a very, very tough fundraise. We, we, it took us uh, a couple of months because it was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then over time, um, our investor base has become much more institutionals, uh, institutional. So our investors now, the big investors are um, pension funds. There are large foundations. There are U.S. universities. So we still have some individuals, but the majority now is, I would say, more sophisticated financial investors, institutional investors. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen that you, um, that you have... Sorry, I've seen that you have at least four funds with, we just talked about it, more than one billion US dollars asset under management. And from what I've seen, more than 15 investments you took as lead um, and you're still an early stage investor. So that's a lot of money to deploy there. Um, I don't know, the, 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 it looks a little bit like the speed and size of the early stage investment has shot up quite a lot. Um, personally, personally, I think they got, they, they have been growing by a hundred percent at least, and they always get earlier the money. At first, you just had to show a, a product, had to show some revenues, but now the investors are getting in early and earlier because they get better valuations. Um, is this also your personal experience that you need to invest more and earlier yeah i think the um the activities have definitely shifted a bit towards more early stage companies um we have always been early investors from the beginning so cherry our fund likes to be the first institutional capital into a business so we often have the case that there's some angels that are already invested sometimes not sometimes we're the first ones Uh, but um, typically we, we invest as a first fund and that's going to stay our strategy. Um, uh, we should talk about the amount. Um, yes, it's a lot of money, but 60% of the fund we reserve to then follow on in our own portfolio company. So if we invest in a seed round and the first institutional round, that means we allocate around 60% of the capital um, to then invest in, uh, in, in the Series A and in the Series B in some of the later rounds. And that's kind of how also then the fund size makes sense or is necessary actually to be a partner, not just from one stage, but actually be a partner for many stages uh, for the company and, 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 and provide them with the necessary funds. Mm -hmm. And um, you asked about how early do investors go? And I think it is, it is right. Of course, the earlier the business, the lower the valuation. But of course, also the riskier the investment. So um, I really believe that investors should be focused, um, stage focused. Um, and, and we are very, very good at you know, doing the seed deals, doing these early deals, spotting the best founders early. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we wouldn't become a growth investor. Like we wouldn't you know, now you know, compete with the Tiger Globals or the uh, the big uh, the big hedge funds also in this world. That's not our business. That's not the business we want to be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, as you said, you've been quite good in picking early um, good startups. Uh, Flixbus, Flix, uh, Jochen, we have him in, the, in, in our interview. We already interviewed the founders of Qualifies and Sanity Group. You've mm -hmm. invested mm -hmm early in the unicorns inform and seller X and you did some mm -hmm. exits. We also covered in our news, like Amorali kitchen stories, flash and post and auto one. I think you, you, you guys have a pretty good, pretty good idea how to track, uh, how to get in early on interesting startups. What's the secret about that? You have to look at a lot of pitch decks and 
learn over time or do you have an algorithm or then you just write an AI and it spits out the good pitch text? Uh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Eh? We can all go to the beach and the AI does the investment for us. Eh? No, that's unfortunately not the case. It's just still very much a, a people's business. Um, in the end, the idea is important, but more important than the idea is a team. So it's very much about understanding who are the brightest minds in the industry and what topics are they thinking about. And um, then, of course, we have a strong view of markets that we like, industries that we like. Um, and uh, if we can match that, if we have a, you know, a, a unique personality, a, a bright mind that is working in an industry that we like, then we start to be very interesting. And then we try to get involved. Um, and we also use technology, not an AI that makes a decision, the decision we need to make, but we use a lot of technology to filter. So we have a few thousand pitch decks that we look at every year. And uh, we also do a lot of outbound. So of course you can apply to Cherry and say like, hey, here's my deck, do you want to invest? But we oftentimes actually turn it around and we look for signals in the market. We screen platforms like Twitter or GitHub, uh, or also LinkedIn. So for example, if you're a, a VP product at Zalando and you change your job title on LinkedIn to something like stealth mode or startup or working on something new, we we get a ping through our software and then we can reach out and, and, and start a conversation. And sometimes it actually leads to an investment. So we are, of course, working with a big team. We are around 30 people that are sort of in across Europe searching for the best opportunities, but then we can enable that a bit through the technology that we've built on top. Mm -hmm. You said there are a few industries you like. Um, can we talk about that before we get to the important question, why you're called Cherry Ventures? <laughs> <laughs> Both very important. Yeah, so we, we typically, we are VC. So um, we look at every single investment has to have the potential to return the entire fund, which means we have to include exclude businesses that may be good businesses, but they just can't to the size that we require as a VC. Um, so we tend to focus on large industries, um, uh, often where there's little digitization, and uh, we believe that these industries will be disrupted over the next couple of years. So just to give you a couple of examples, we've been very active in FinTech, uh, an area which, uh, you know, the banks, you had the big banks and the entire FinTech value chain has been disaggregated and there have been more and more startups focusing on smaller parts of the value chain like fx or like consumer banking or uh lending um so and uh, and and there have been some very successful outcome uh, in this space my partner christian uh, focuses a lot on food uh, um, alternative uh, protein for example um, he's in a few delivery companies that he's invested in um I also have a strong focus on health. Um, health tech, obviously a, a massive market opportunity in terms of the size of the market. After a little technical interruption, since you you, you lost your internet back there in London, um, Philip is back and we still need to um, clarify why you are Sherry Ventures. Yeah, true. Now we talked about great streaming and internet and now we lose each other in the middle of London. Um, no, but Cherry, the name, um, there's a lot of stories to it. The, the easiest one is, of course, you know, cherry picking, uh, the cherry on the on top that we liked. So we were actually thinking about names and we wanted to do something that's a bit different, different from the other. So we didn't want to name it after a tree, like Oak Tree Ventures or Sequoia, like some of the American funds. We wanted something mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more, you know, seed and uh also with a bit of a twinkle in the eye and we like cherry and uh, we picked it and we don't really remember why but we like it and we're going to keep it okay understood um when everybody's watching this for the very simple reason they want to get you on board as investor as you said early stage you want to be the first institutional money so likely pre-seed most of the time i would assume seed funding yeah, seed, pre-seed. Sometimes we can do a Series A, uh, but uh, usually uh, we stick to seed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Understood. Oh, where are you focusing? Is there like a certain geography 
where you invest? Yes, yes. We, we support a lot when we invest. So um, we work closely with our teams um, and our founders. And that's also why we focus almost exclusively on Europe. We have some exceptions to that rule, but they are usually European teams that have moved to the US or moved elsewhere. And uh, within Europe, we have a strong focus on the DAF region, Germany, uh, of course, being the most important. We're also our headquarters. We have a bigger office in London, where I am today here, even though we don't have good internet. And then we have an office in Stockholm. <gasps> okay, I see. Um, what is your normal ticket size if you invest? Um, it starts very small. We can do a few hundred thousand. The average ticket is larger. It's around two to three million. And we can also do investments that are larger than that. So I think the largest initial check that we've written is probably around uh, six, seven million. Mm -hmm. You are investing in startups. We're currently at a very trying time when we're recording this beginning of September. Um, we are not sure about the heating about the energy in europe throughout yeah. the winter yeah. hopefully it will be not too harsh uh but nobody knows for sure um the question is what do you expect for your startups your portfolio in the next let's say two years currently i would assume a recession with a high inflation combined yeah i think that is pretty clear we are heading or we are actually already in a recession And that, of course, will impact the startup industry as a whole. You see it already. If you look at the numbers, um, the investment volumes this year are significantly below last year. Last year, we were on all-time highs uh, across the board. There was almost uh, that everyone became a startup investor. There were also so many new funds and angels. And we are seeing now that as money gets more expensive with increasing inflation and then, of course, Uh, consumers not being able to uh, to spend as much because they need to save because energy costs going up that of course that has an impact on on our portfolio it has an impact on the startups overall and if you look at the public market so the startups that are already sort of not startups anymore but they went public you also see a huge correction throughout the course of this year right so the multiples evaluations have come down significantly the way we think about it is like we we always want to back amazing teams and we will continue to do that also in a time like this so in, in a financial crisis in a recession um, but as a founder you need to of course focus more on profitability growth is important but it's not everything so it's important that as a founder you think about how can i reach profitability with the company how can i actually build a good business and not just something that has big growth numbers but it's never going to make money so in that sense, there's definitely a, a little bit of a mind shift uh, that has been going on in our industry for the past couple of months. Yeah, mm -hmm. You guys are also crypto investors. Crypto has been beaten pretty badly recently, not only with the decline in the cryptocurrencies, but also with with the big uh, with the big fallouts of big names like um, like Celsius. Um, What is your outlook for the current market? So it's a very volatile market in, in, at the moment, which I think we, we believe this volatility is going to remain for the next few months at least. Um, we are not a crypto-only investor. We have uh, made some investments in the, sta in, the sta in the space, but more from the perspective that we believe that there's a lot of interesting application for blockchain um, to actually support Uh, uh, interesting businesses. Um, so when it's like, for example, if you think about, you know, security or fintech in the DeFi space, so you won't find us investing into the next hot coin that sort of we hope will explode in value, but we don't really know what's behind it. That's, that's not what we do. But we invest into crypto businesses where crypto is more the technology layer that will in, uh, enable the value creation um, that this this business um, uh, wants to uh, wants to promote. So um, in that sense, of course, we are hit by markets like every other investors. But um, I think the the uh, the companies that we have that were not the ones that were trading at these like moon dream valuations that then came crashing down uh, that didn't really concern our portfolio. Luckily, mm -hmm. 
talking about the portfolio, as you said, you do a lot of outreach, but you also are, of course, uh, encouraging interesting startups to pitch. As we said, no good idea to pitch you via LinkedIn. Um, there is an email address, deal at sherry.vc. That's most likely where all the pitches should go, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can send a pitch there. I, I would encourage um, founders that are interested in, in, in partnering. I would really encourage them to connect directly to one of our team members. It's possible. It's easy. Like we are traveling all the time. We are at the different conferences. We host office hours. So I would say try and build a personal connection um, because, as I said, like we there's a few thousand pitch decks that we are looking at every year, and it's important that your your sticks out in a way. And I think it's much much easier to to achieve that when there's a little bit of a you know personal connection. So I would encourage people to to try and find ways to connect with us directly rather than via you know TMAT or DLAT uh, Cherry. Mm -hmm. Talking about the ultimate personal connections, you guys are also hiring, right? Yeah, we are hiring. We are always hiring. Um, we are strengthening the team. Just uh, brought on a new team member for the Stockholm office recently, um, a new hire also for London. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, it's never going to be a 100 people team. We wanted to keep it small. We want to stay lean as a firm, but uh, we are adding talent uh, from time to time. So if that's interesting to you, yeah, please reach out as well. Of course, down here in the show notes on our Medium blog, there will be the link. And the last question I have for you, where do you want Cherry to be in five years down the road? Yeah, we love what we do. We love early stage investing. So as I said, we, we are not going to become this massive uh, growth fund that invests across all stages. We want to stay focused and uh, want to continue building the platform, the Cherry platform. We want to be the firm that is the first call to any ambitious founder in Europe that wants to work on something uh, new and something exciting. And uh, yeah, we're working hard to to getting there. We're not there yet, but uh, I think we're on a good way. Great. Um, again, thank you, for, uh, thank you very much for the interview. Congratulations to winning the German Startup Award 2022 category investor. And of course, best of luck for your ventures and Sherry Ventures. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. It was great to be on the show and hope to speak soon. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, Sherry is caring. When you're an entrepreneur with a great idea, it can be daunting to find funding. Startup Raven takes the process out of your hands by helping entrepreneurs connect and learn about potential investors all in one place without any long filled forms or thousand questions. Sign up for early access at startupraven.com.